uh, special, there is a special guest, but there is a special gift for all of the fathers that are going to be here Sunday, so you'll want to be here to capture that. And Pastor has mentioned briefly about his message. He has a specific message for Sunday that you'll want to be a part of. With your family, come. Let's have a great time Sunday. Maybe if you see someone between now and then, invite them to come celebrate Father's Day with you. I know it's going to be a great day. But for now, I am really excited to hear Pastor Ryan tonight. Why don't we stand and welcome him? Encourage you to grab a, a pen, a notepad, a Bible, whatever he tells us to do. We're excited to hear you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. I wish I had half the energy that he has. Wish I could preach as excitingly as he could preach as he did Sunday. He did a phenomenal, phenomenal job, didn't he? So good to be with you tonight. It's such a great crowd with camps going on. You, you never know. So such a great crowd. Thank you for being at church tonight. I'm glad to be here with you. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of clarity brings confidence. Clarity brings confidence. Lord, help me to speak what you want me to speak tonight. Lord, I pray for this congregation. I pray for every individual that may be watching online, Lord, that you would allow them to receive exactly what they need to receive. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Most mornings, I get up and I do the exact same things. How many of you do that? Most of you. Almost every morning. I, I'm a routine kind of a guy. I love routine. And it's what makes me so productive. It's why I can take on a high volume of tasks. It's why I can, I can do the job that I do. I can consistently and confidently perform well in those things over and over again, day in and day out, week in and week out, I love routine. And I'm not perfect with it, but one of the greatest, one of my greatest strengths is my, in my personality is my structure and my consistency. But because of that, change and even risk, risk taking, they can be really, really tough for me. That's the, that's the downside of having that gift is you have a weakness of, of not being able to adapt to change real well. Especially if I'm not processing what's actually going on and I can't help that. That's just my nature. But here's reality after working with people for a few decades. Change, especially significant change, is very tough for most people. And there are some people that, that love change. They love variety. But I'd say that most people don't like change and they don't like taking risk, whether they be physical risk or relational or financial or social or spiritual. Most people don't like change. They like the same old thing over and over again. And so most people resist change in their life. And by insisting that everything stay the same in your life, you're actually increasing your stress. You're actually increasing the anxiety that's associated with that. And you're really bringing more negative change into your life because of that resistance than if you would just embrace and accept the change that's inevitable in your life. Now, I realize that embracing and accepting change, especially negative change, is much easier said than, than done. I get that. But here's the deal. Here's something that, that you can be confident of. There will never be a moment in your entire life that will ever repeat again. And you can never fully re-experience a moment that you have already lived. You can be confident of that. 
So the fact of the matter is, is that life is really about change. And life is about facing challenges. And, and yes, even facing problems. And yes, even taking risk. It's about chaos that's ever-changing, that, that's sinful, that's unclear. Life is about navigating the surety of change. Life is about navigating the constancy of change, not the constancy of routine. I once heard it said that facing the unknown and uncertainty of life means that we must tolerate the unfamiliar and unexpected. I'll repeat that again. Facing the unknown and uncertainty of life means that we must tolerate the unfamiliar and the unexpected. And here's the deal. The more clarity we can bring to particular areas of our life, actually three particular areas of your life, the more surety and the more confidence that we can have that the unfamiliar and the unexpected things of life are going to be okay. And so I know that the raging question in your head right now is, Ryan, what are these three things that will bring such a confidence to my life? What's the recipe for confidence? Let's go to Scripture. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet is addressing Judah and the leaders of Judah, and he's pleading with them to trust God even though they were facing overwhelming odds. And, and he was trying to give them instructions and hope and, and even confidence as they navigated the uncertainty of the future. And even though Isaiah had great prophetic insight, there was three things that is very evident that he relied on. There was three things that he sought clarity on so that he would increase his confidence. So let's read them. Isaiah 6, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So we see that Isaiah had clarity on who God was. Let's keep reading. Verse 2. Above it stood the, the seraphims. Each one had, had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And so in that moment, we see that Isaiah had great clarity of who he was. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the, with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth. Ouch. And said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom, who will go for us? Then said I, Here, I, here am I, send me. And so finally in these verses we see that Isaiah had clarity in what his mission was or what his calling was. And so in these verses, we see that Isaiah had great clarity of, number one, who God was. Number two, who he was. And then number three, what he was called to do. And because Isaiah had great clarity in these three things, it's very evident in Scripture that it brought a great confidence to his life. Clarity brings confidence. And so tonight I want to quickly walk through each of these three points of clarity that I know will bring a great confidence to your life if you will truly embrace them. Because clarity brings confidence. Number one, clarity in who God is. The very first thing that we must get clarity around is who 
God is. Amen. Psalms 119, 105, the, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The first thing that I need to know about the subject of clarity of who God is is that God's word serves as a guiding light that brings so much clarity to our lives and to our understanding of who God really is. His word is a guiding force and a foundational piece for anything that we want to establish related to God. If we can't establish it in the word of God, then there's no clarity. There's no clarity on who God is, especially of who God is in our lives. His word is going to give us a great deal of insight into who God really is. His attributes, his character, his personality. Listen to this, to this powerful couple of verses regarding God's character. Exodus 34, 6-7. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and, and sin. And so we see here that God's character is made up of things such as love and grace and forgiveness and long-suffering and truth. And the Bible is just full, full of verses that gives us a great understanding of these aspects of God that have the ability to bring clarity to our minds of who God really is. And this in turn will bring a great confidence in His unchanging nature and His stability in our lives. And, and then another aspect of God that we need clarity on to understand Him better is, is the salvation message. Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And a great summary of our salvation message is found in Acts 2, 38. And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And, and when we find clarity around the subject of the gospel, it helps us understand a little better why God robed himself in flesh and why he took on the form of man to die for our sins. And the gospel message of the death, which is repentance and burial, which is baptism and the resurrection, which is the Holy Ghost. And when we have clarity of him through this gospel message, it's amazing the confidence that can come in our lives. And then understanding God's promises is also a, a critical part of knowing who God is. There's so much assurance. So much assurance and stability that comes from understanding and trusting in God's promises. Listen to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God in Him are yea and, and in Him amen and to the glory of God by us. And, and when we can hold on to these promises... It just brings confidence to his faithfulness. It brings confidence. Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate from us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's all right. That's a promise. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew Him not. Romans 8, 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep us, keep you from evil. And we can go on and on and on and on and we can read scripture after scripture. We could, we could read scripture till the sun comes up tomorrow on his promises. And I'll go as far as to say that you must get clarity in your life and in your mind in who God is. Because here's what I need you to know. If you get clarity in who 
God is, it's going to bring great confidence in your life. Because I know that clarity brings confidence. Second thing. Finding clarity in God is most important. But when you have clarity in who God is, it's important to then find clarity in who you are. When Adam and Eve were hiding from God in the garden after they had eaten the forbidden fruit, at that point, all God really wanted for them was for them to stop and see themselves as they were. And I'm having an iPad malfunction. Pray, people, pray. No, seriously, pray. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I think I found clarity again. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus said, where are you, Adam? Who told you that you were naked, Adam? Have you eaten of the tree, Adam? He asked those questions, but, but he was God, right? He knew the answer. He knew the answer to those questions. But, but asked them because he was wanting Adam and Eve to admit to who they really were. They were flawed human beings that absolutely needed relationship with God. Listen to David's words as, as he cried out in Psalms 19, 12 through 14. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from, my, from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. My strength, my redeemer. David had clarity on who he was. And David's talking about the, the meditation of his own heart. He's talking about what, he, what he's dwelling on, his motives, his desires. His secret faults. And without God, David knows that there's no redemption. He knows that without God, he doesn't even have strength. Without God, he's helpless. Without God, I'm nothing. Why don't you say that with me? Without God, I'm nothing. But with God... I'm the apple of his eye. With God, I'm the bride of Christ. With God, he creates, a, he creates a clean heart within me. With God, he, he brings tremendous life in me from nothing. I know my place, and I'm nothing without you, oh God. Don't hide behind your mask. Don't hide behind that prideful mask. Don't hide behind that self-pity mask or, or oh, that ho oh, holier than thou religious mask. Don't hide behind your mask. The Lord just desires that we're honest with Him and honest with ourselves and who we actually are. It's one thing to try to hide from others, but it's a much dangerous place when you try to hide from yourself or hide from God. And it's not easy, but, but when you gain clarity of yourself, it's amazing how much confidence will come to you. Back to the scripture that we started with, Isaiah 6.1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. A little symbolism here, the, the earthly king of your life has to die before the heavenly king will be lifted up in your temple. 
the fleshly king, your, your flesh has to die before the Lord will sit on the throne of your life. Listen to this. That, that scripture says his train filled the temple. The definition of the word train is this. The, the first definition is to bring a desired standard. Then the second definition of train is a series of connected rail cars. And we know that the priority is his presence in the throne room, right? That's his, that's his priority. That's the priority. And so when you get a revelation of Jesus sitting on the throne of your life, there's a series of connected events that begin to happen. And the aftermath is a train of, are you ready for this? A train of change that brings you to a desired standard. And here's what I need you to know. You'll never see yourself as you really are until you get a revelation of who He is in your life. And once you get clarity of who Jesus is in your life, then you can find clarity of who you really are. You, can put the, you can't put the cart before the horse. And clarity of Jesus is first and foremost. But that will lead, will then lead to clarity in who you are. Because clarity brings confidence. But here's one of the issues. Some people get a revelation of who Jesus is. They find clarity of who he is. They experience Salvation even. They love Him. They read Scripture. They learn about who Jesus is in their life. But they never take the next step and get the revelation or the clarity of Him sitting on the throne of their life. And here's why this is so important. The moment we get clarity of Him being on the throne of our lives then that's when Jesus begins to rule our lives. And when he begins to rule, it's amazing the confidence that comes to our lives. Isaiah 9, 6-7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Remember this scripture. We quote it so often. Every year at Christmas time and many times throughout the year, we quote that scripture. Well, listen to the next verse, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. We have to understand that, that his kingdom has no end, which means it's always expanding. And it's always, his kingdom is always growing. And it's always taking on more territory. He's never satisfied with ruling just a small part of your kingdom. He wants to rule it all. And wherever he rules, there's peace. Wherever he rules, there's clarity. Wherever he rules, there's going to be confidence. Which means that we don't have to fear. We may have chaos all around us. We may even have chaos in our own homes. But if Jesus is the one that's sitting on the throne of our lives, we don't have to fear the outcome. We can trust. Whatever happens, whatever happens, it'll be worked out for my good, for the good of those who are called according to His purpose. And I may have chaos in my finances, but as long as he rules my pocketbook, I'm going to be okay. And I may have chaos in, in my marriage, but as long as he sits on the throne and I'm letting him rule my life, everything is going to be okay. I may have chaos on my job, but if I have clarity on who I am in relation to who he is, then I have confidence that everything is going to be okay. And if you ever get a revelation, if you ever see him on the throne, 
in control of your life, then and only then will you get clarity on who you are. And one thing I know in this life is this. Clarity brings confidence. And so I have clarity of who Jesus is. I have clarity of who I am. And that's going to lead to the third component of clarity. Number three, clarity in what, in what you've been called to do. I have clarity on what I am called to do. Let me ask you a question. What was the purpose of Jesus coming to earth and taking on a human form? His purpose was all about Calvary. The main reason that Jesus came to earth was for the cross, right? He was here to be the sacrificial lamb of God. And so it, so it can be said that the sole purpose of Jesus Christ is the redemption of the lost souls of mankind, right? Listen to Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke, who was the beloved physician, he was a Greek that was won by the Apostle Paul, possibly at Antioch where he was likely from. But Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke in the, in the book of Acts. And I'm bringing this to your attention because I need you to know that Luke never saw Jesus in person. He never walked with the Lord. Yet he defends the Gospel in a way like no other. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding, perfect clarity of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things, the confidence, clarity brings confidence, wherein thou hast been instructed. But you see there that it wasn't delivered unto him. And we see that Luke writes his gospel with such compassion and such passion. And he describes in, in vivid detail the Son of Man and, and his mission to save the lost of mankind. And the stories that Luke chooses to recount are, 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 are showing Jesus reach for those that nobody wanted. It shows that, that Jesus reached for, for people that no one liked. Think about that. You got Zacchaeus, the, the tax collector, that no one wanted to be around. You've got, you've got the lepers that no one wanted to be around. You've you got the paralytic and the demoniac on, and on and on and on. People that no one in society wanted. Luke records Jesus going after those people. Those people. Luke shows Jesus in his humanity and, and compassion for the lost and hurting. And somehow Luke has caught the vision of reaching a lost world. And somehow, status no longer means anything to Luke. Because through his words, we see that, that he's so passionate about telling someone. He's so passionate about writing the words that will lead to someone else finding clarity in who Jesus is. And gaining the confidence that they need to live a life. With Jesus. Luke could have been content to just stay at Antioch and, and practice medicine and make a good income and, and maybe help even help a few people, but but something, something got a hold of the physician and he had to tell someone about Jesus. You see, Luke was so compelled to share the gospel in great detail, yet, like you himself. He never met Jesus in the flesh. Think about that. Where did this passion for a lost world come from? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 17 through 20. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in God's stead, be ye reconciled to God. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And now we are ambassadors of Christ. And now you are an ambassador to Christ. And you may be a physician. You may be sitting in the congregation. You may be, may be watching online. You may be a physician. You may be a lawyer by trade. You, you may be a salesman. You may be a carpenter. You may be an administrative assistant. All of those skills are they're great and they are very much needed in life. But let's be real clear here. You are an ambassador first. And you have been given the ministry of reconciliation and you are an ambassador of Christ first. Listen to the words that Luke ended his gospel with in chapter 24, verses 45 through 49. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all, all, all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Should be preached in his names. In his name among all nations. This is clarity for your mission as a Christian. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. Let me repeat that again. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. Luke 14, 33 through 35. So likewise, whosoever... He be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. He cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if that salt have lost his Savior, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Luke said that, that you are the salt, but if you have lost your Savior, then how will this world be saved? And if you lose your clarity on what you have been called to do, then this world will never be saved. You interact with people, each one of you. Point to yourself right here. Each one of you interact with individuals throughout your week that no other apostolic person interacts with. Luke 2, 32. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. You are the light to the Gentiles. And so if you don't bring the light to this world, then the world will continue to live in darkness. Luke 14, 23, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that, that, that my house may be filled. Our calling is to compel. Our calling is to compel. It's to drive. It's to urge people to come into the house. That the house may be filled. And let me tell you something. We've still got room, people. Look around you. Look around you on a Sunday. We still have, we still have room, people. We have not filled this house. 
And if we can fill this house once, we can fill it twice. There's people in this community that need the gospel. And clarity brings confidence. And I'm closing here. But when you find clarity in who God is, it's going to help you find clarity in who you are. And then it's going to help you find clarity in your calling. And it's amazing, it's amazing the confidence that you can find when you find clarity in those three things. Can we all stand? And if you don't mind, I'm not going to hold you, but just a few minutes, if you could walk to the front. We'll go home by way of the altar just to would love for everyone to just join for a moment in prayer. <clears throat> Monday in my devotion time, Monday morning in my devotion time, I, I wasn't even, even sure exactly what I would be preaching tonight. But the Lord gave me these these few verses to give to you tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. Follow them. And I'm not going to elaborate on these scriptures. I, I want you to let the word sink in. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it. But keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I give you. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did. Verse 9, only be careful and watch yourself closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Don't allow your vision to get foggy. Don't allow it to get unclear. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. So bring clarity to your kids. You get clarity. Then bring clarity to your kids and your grandkids. And verse 24. For the Lord your God. Is a consuming fire. I want you to know tonight. We serve a jealous God. We serve a jealous God. And I have confidence. That I'm going to win. Because I have great clarity. On who God is. On who I am. And exactly what I've been called to do. And I don't know exactly where you may be at in your life. But I challenge you tonight. I challenge you tonight. To evaluate your clarity. For just a few moments. Will you do that with me? Why don't you lift your hands. Lift your voices. I want you to just talk to the Lord about those three things. Who God is. Who I am. And my calling. Ask the Lord to reveal to you any area, to, any area of, un, of unclarity that doesn't have clarity. Any area that doesn't have clarity. Ask Him to reveal it to you right now. I challenge you right now to, as you're praying, to search your heart. Search your mind. Search your life right now. And ask Him to reveal to you. In this moment, ask Him to reveal to you where you need clarity.
And as he's speaking some things to you, the next step in this prayer, and this may linger into tomorrow or, or the rest of the week even, I want you to pray and ask him to give you the next step to find that clarity. Is it a person you need in your life? Is it the word of God that needs to jump out at you and, and give you a specific word that brings that clarity? What is it that will bring that clarity? Just ask him right now. And one last thing before we leave tonight I just want you to begin to praise him and worship him for who he is I love you Jesus I love you Jesus I love you Jesus I love you Jesus you're so worthy, Jesus. You're so worthy, Jesus. Thank you for being such a great church and being here on a Wednesday night. Thank you online for being here. Have a, have a blessed night. God bless you.